Here we are today with Dan Gillespie Cells in the most amazing location. We are in the Hard Rock Cafe in uh, Old Park Lane and we have got everything around us, mate. We've got John Lennon's glasses. We're sitting on Jimi Hendrix's seat. We've got his guitar there. We've That's got right. Madonna's thing. <laughs> but you all know Madonna's Vogue thing. Um, you're no stranger to Hard Rock Cafes because you've been opening them and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, I did an opening for Hard Rock in, in Belgium, which was lovely. And um, we got very drunk and we had some lovely drinks and I played a few songs and smashed a guitar. <laughs> That's how they open them. They smash, they smash guitars. And That's awesome went. though, isn't it? Um, yeah, it was lovely actually. Huey from Fun Loving Criminals was DJing. And Fantastic. We, yeah. had, we had a lovely time. Yeah, and they really looked after us. Brilliant. And, and you did one in Manchester as well, didn't you? We played uh, one in Manchester when they refurbed it and they did another opening there, so yeah. we, we did one there. They've got such cool staff. I mean, that's the great thing. We've got Bob Dylan's guitar over there. I've yeah. Got, I've got Keith Richards' guitar here. And Freddie Mercury's seat. Oh, I know, right? It's, it's just... <laughs> From it's the just Ming Dynasty, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They said, that is a real sort of priceless jewel in here sort of wow. thing. So that's a proper Ming Dynasty thing, yeah? I should yeah? probably have the gloves on if I'm going to touch it. But, but yeah. the... No, you don't need that. But, but um, this, this apparently as well, right? They were telling me about it when we started off. Mm. And... Um, it used to be where the Queen had her jewels. Wow. Yeah. Wow, under here in the vault. This is it, because this was the vault of Coots Bank. <gasps> Interesting. Oh, that makes sense, because I can see that this cabinet here, this now display cabinet, is actually, it looks like it's an, actually an old... I've um, never noticed that before. <laughs> that's does. an old safe, isn't it? You know, the door, obviously, yeah. swings around, and that's an old safe. Yeah, and this one here as well. And then, yeah, and then after that, it was uh, it was uh, Princess Diana's wedding dress. This is where they kept it before the wedding and stuff like that. Wow, that's interesting. So, uh, wow, what a cool room. Yeah, it's amazing. You were most known for the feeling, coming out with amazing songs. And I, you know, I love it when you call. And uh, I, I, the reason I asked you for the interview mainly is I looked at some of your stuff. You're really interesting person. But also, you know, what got me on sort of the track with the feeling was yeah. uh, Fill My Little World and right. I love that song. All right, thank it's you. It's just awesome though, isn't thank it? Thank you. So you come out of school, yes. tell me, how, how did this happen? Well, you... I met the boys at the, in the band when I was 16. Yeah. So we were all at the Brit School together yeah. um, down in Croydon. And I was from London and the boys were from Sussex. And uh, we got together and just after a couple of days of being at this new school, I noticed they had these rehearsal rooms with drum kits and guitars in them and stuff. And I thought, well, let's start a band and, and just started talking about it with a couple of friends. And then that turned into the feeling. But it was actually 10 years after that that we got our record deal. And in the meantime, we toured around playing gigs with friends and different lineups. And we then started doing session work for people. And then we started playing on other people's records and carried on learning how to write songs. and and worked kind of behind the scenes in the music business for 10 years. And then, and then at some point, it was time for us to do our own thing. And that's when the feeling really kicked off in 2006. Yeah. Um, or 2005 was when we got our record deal and, and started putting things out. And then by 2006, we had our first album out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's been an interesting kind of 10 years of being successful, preceded by 10 years of just knocking around and trying to make a living. Yeah. So it's been 20 years we've been working together now. So it seems a, seems a long, actually no, it doesn't seem a long time. It actually seems to have flown by quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I mean, you live an incredible lifestyle. But a lot of people on that note, you know, there's a lot of people that think, so sort of, when the feeling sort of came out, it was like, boom, there they are. Mm. You know, fantastic songs and all this. And so many people think that that was Oh, they probably just got together a few weeks ago and then... Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it does happen like that for some bands. Some people do. But for us, it was it was 10 years of learning our trade, playing weddings. or, or play. We went to the French Alps and we played 10 shows a week in, in ski bars and stuff. You know, we did yeah. play covers and we played some of our own stuff and we, we experimented. And, and, you know, I remember playing when I was... A, really young I went on tour with like Jennifer Page who was had a song called Crush yeah. that was a big yeah hit. yeah and I toured all around Europe as her guitarist and just literally doing doing playing acoustic guitar for her around radio stations when she had that record out so you know it's 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 weird there was a lot of um 
a lot of uh, almost getting their moments. We had a record deal when we were 19 or 20, and, and that kind of fell through. And the lead singer of that band um, kind of got signed on her own. We had a female lead singer, and then yeah. I stepped up to be the singer after that. Yeah. So I think if none of these things would have happened, it, you know, the story would be very different. Um, but eventually we ended up um, we ended up making that album 12 Stops and Home and and you know the film A Little World was the first kind of release but Sewn was the one that really yeah, got us noticed yeah that's a great song um, yeah. and then followed that up with Never Be Lonely yeah and then Love It When You Call yeah and then Rosé which later got used as part of a Burberry campaign um, and then the second um, went away made the second album um, took a took a little while because we produce everything ourselves and we engineer everything ourselves and just do it all ourselves um, except for the mix someone else does that but we're quite self-sufficient and we like to do it ourselves and write everything ourselves um, so it takes a little while but by the time the second album came out it was probably 2008 and then we we um, had um, thought it was over and, and yeah. songs like that um, and what's mad is after 10 years of doing that, we've got our fifth album out and we're still playing 20 festivals. Every You're all over the place, aren't you? Um, yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to really, um, you either kind of keep going or you give yourself a break, but giving yourself a break sometimes is quite hard because then you're suddenly kind of trying to get back into the flow of it again and you kind of forget how to do it. Or you think you've forgotten how to do it. It's quite yeah. scary stopping, actually. I've started to realise this. There's a reason why people carry on. It's because it's quite scary to stop. Yeah, because you're used to it. It's, it's what you're comfortable with. You're so used to it. And after years of it, you, you get so comfortable. And um, if you stop, then you think, how am I ever going to start again? You know, yeah. well, I've forgotten how to do it. You know, will it work? And, and it's a bit, it takes a bit of courage to stop. But we are yeah. going to after this tour in October. Ah. Um, just take a couple of years out. Yeah. And um, come back though. We will be back. <laughs> we want you back. Well, we wanted to. <laughs> we decided that if we take the next so 2017 off, and maybe 2018, by the end of that, it'll have been 12 years since 12 Stops on Home came out. Yeah. So we thought it'd be nice to do a 12 Stops on Home tour. Yeah. Uh, you know, call it 12 Years and Home or something. Yeah. And tour with just playing songs from my first record. And do a little kind of reunion tour after twelve years. That was something that would be quite nice. How how did you you know when you were sort of you started everything on your own stuff like that? But then it's like you you know you go into YouTube and stuff and you mm. can see the videos like fill my little world yeah. and I love it when you call and so on and all these people yeah. the, all these things they're so well put together. How did you get the people? Were you just well? Would you mean the videos? Yeah, so it's so well, well done. The things videos like that. were the videos were. Island Records, who we were signed to, were they had back in them days they had a video commissioner, yeah, um, and wonderful woman who used to be at Island Records called Liz Kessler. She, her job was to f match up the artist with a with a really good director, yeah, and so they found a, a video director called Caswell Coggins who um, is a really interesting guy who had this idea for the Sewn video that would be kind of yeah. That's crazy. You start to get wrapped yeah. up with things. And um, he just had a lovely vision, and that was our first video. And actually, to this day, I think it's one of our best videos. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it was a very simple idea and well executed. And, you know, some of our other videos I'm not a fan of. Yeah. Um, I, the Film My Little World video, I just cannot bear. I like it's it. Ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know what is even going on in it. <laughs> and the, 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 I love it when you call the video, which Caswell also did, is a bit kind of overblown. Oh, come on, that's, that, that's good. Like, I mean, you, you're in New York and it's just... Well, yeah, I know, but I'm thinking what is going on in this video because yeah, it's, it's just this limos there's and cars and yeah. gangsters and casinos and and it's weird. I mean, it's, I, I, I kind of can look back on it with a smile now, but yeah. there's a point where... I think at the time we just didn't, we were just like, we're having hits, let's just do crazy things and, and, yeah. and play around. On that note, how important is it to take risks if you want to be successful? Oh, it's hugely important. I think it's interesting. I was just um, talking with someone today about it. Um, you have to take risks and you have to be bold and you have to stick up for what you want. When we started, the risky thing to do was to be pop. 
Um, and the safer thing to do would have been to be more indie. Because yeah. cause in 2005, everyone wanted to sound like The Strokes, you know, and everyone wanted to sound quite rock and roll. And everyone was doing that. And even the pop bands suddenly had guitars. And it yeah. was all right. Do you remember? It was, there was a moment Radio 1 only played... Just guitar. put a guitar in his hand! You know, right? Yeah. It, it, Radio 1 had guitar cool. bands. You know, even the even Capital and those yeah. stations, everyone was kind of like doing, nah, 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 doing guitar-y stuff. And uh, I, we, were, we were kind of a bit bored of it. And yeah. we grew up with with indie that we remember from the '90s, so we were a bit like, "Oh, I don't buy this, really." So when we came around to doing our record, uh, we wanted to do something different and that wasn't fake or false in any way. And we thought, well, that "I think the more dangerous place to go is to tr is try and be pretty and get away with it, yeah. or try and make melodies that are that are clear and obvious and and generous and that aren't." too concerned with being cool yeah and for me that was the dangerous place to go to so it's weird that that there was always this idea that being mainstream and being pop was easy and doing something else was much harder and artier and i think it was the opposite yeah i think being in the more poppy place is more dangerous I think because you're on that line and you get judged very harshly if you're doing something pop when if you do something avant-garde everyone's too yeah. scared to judge you because they don't want to think they, they go oh well maybe I just don't understand it so they go oh, yeah it's really good and there's a lot yeah. of emperor's new clothes in that world um, but in the world of pop music you are on the line you have to be judged on whether it's you're right out there on the stage it's everything right isn't out it? there it's, it's, it's very much out there and particularly at that time so the record labels said you know you need to get beards and and don't dress so smart and and, and oh. take away the harmonies and make the guitars a bit louder. That was all the kind of chat yeah. that was going around management always. And we were quite weirdly, we were quite um, defiant, and we we're like, no, yeah. this is how we sound. That's a new. It's not. It's, yeah. It sounds. It's not cool. It's deliberately not cool. That's what we wanted, and um, and I suppose it worked. Well, it did. I would never do yeah. that now. That's a bold decision to yeah. go against the record company and just say, you know, I know you want this and you can fund all this money and stuff like that, but hang on, this is who we are. We're going to stand firm and we're just we're going to roll how we want to roll. Yes, and it was heavily ironic because obviously everyone thought that that was the <laughs> manufactured sound, and everyone thought that the people that are really being themselves and artistic and and credible were the ones that sounded like no 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 no. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, no, it's the other way around. In order to be successful in pop music, you have to have character. In order for character to come across, you have to be genuine. Yeah. I don't think there's such a thing as kind of faking it in, in pop music. You, either you get, found out, you get found out as well. You get found out. Definitely. And it's hard to write perfect pop songs with, with, with melodies and, and hooks that, that are just clean and pure and that lots of people can relate to and catch on to. That's actually hard. That's a challenge for me. Yeah. Um, to make that kind of pure pop music. But you were with uh, you were with Mel C just before you come here, um, and it was she's a risk taker as well, isn't she? Yeah, she's funny, I love her. Uh, she's she? very, <laughs> she's really fun. We're yeah, doing, we're doing this um, a, a festival, and and um, it's something that Chris Evans organised. Yeah, yeah. He kind of said, um, said, would you be up for doing a song with Mel at the festival? So, yeah, great. So she came over to us. Fantastic. And she's lovely. She's a lovely singer. She's she amazing. Yeah, she, and. Yeah. Yeah, she's one of those people who's had like an incredible, uh, it's an incredible career, an incredible. Um, she's got incredible experience. She's been through something that very, very few people in the world will have been through being in the biggest girl band. Phenomenal, ever. wasn't it? You know, yeah. I mean, what an experience, what a thing to have experienced, and to come out of that, kind of humble and sweet and nice. And that's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. she's just it says a lot. Yeah. She's one of the lads, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> she's like she one of the. Yeah. She's like this no is cool. That's what you like about it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. She's like you know you can meet her in the street. She'll have a, have a sort yeah. of a, a chat stuff like that. Yeah. There's a story, right? So I've been re doing some research on you and stuff like uh, that. So I love this. So you were brought up with your um, your mum and your dad initially, and yeah. then your your mum um she went lesbian and yeah. went with another woman. Yeah. Um, and when you came out, 
Yeah. They wanted a party. Is this a true story? It's why well, they threatened. My mum threatened to throw me a party when I came out. <laughs> and I, I thought that's the worst thing you could possibly do to yeah. a teenager anyway. And how old were you then when you sort of came out? I don't know, like quite late. Yeah. Like horrifyingly late, like 17 or 18 or something. And I knew I was gay when I was like eight. Really? Probably, or even yeah. younger, because I knew what it was. Yeah, yeah. You know, it wasn't like I had to kind of, I had these feelings and then I had to discover what gay was. I knew what gay was when I was tiny. Yeah. And when I was probably about eight, I kind of was like, well, quite clear that I was gay. But um, I d you don't want to talk about it with your parents. No, it's not cool. <laughs> it's not cool. Because like, otherwise, you know, and for me, really, when I was talking about being gay when I was that age, I was kind of just basically talking about who I fancied. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really want to talk about who I fancied with my mum. I was like, no, I don't want to talk about that, even though she really wanted me to. But um, they were very sweet, and I'm very, what I feel very grateful for was that I didn't have to have an awful coming out moment where I thought they might reject me, or a coming out moment where you I thought they might. You knew they'd be fine. I knew they would be fine, and I knew they'd still be proud of me, and I knew that all of those things that are very important for someone yeah. um, were there, and, and I feel very grateful for that because. Yeah. It's not the case for 90% of people when they come out. They're scared. The parents were terrified. The, if the dad is a sort of uh, I'm a yes. very masculine sort of. Or, or for whatever reasons, religious reasons, cultural reasons, they feel that, um, they feel that there's a risk in, in, telling, in telling people. And it's quite rough, actually, to have to tell your folks about that stuff because it's personal and it's, it's kind yeah. of... It's, yes, it's how you want to live your life, but it's also related to sex and it's related to all yeah. these things. And you're like, you, you know, if you're like me, you just don't want to talk about that stuff with your parents. I didn't have the don't. sex chat with my, my mum and dad. Yeah. I didn't want the sex chat. And unfortunately, I never got it. I don't think you yeah. need it either. You well, kind of find out, don't you? Well, you need to find out somehow. Otherwise, yeah. things will go horribly wrong. But it's like, whether it's your parents, I don't know. We probably should. It's probably, <laughs> it's probably healthy to be able to talk about that stuff with your parents. It probably is healthy. It's just, you know, I'm just yeah. so English that I would, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, don't make me talk about it. No. And also the thing yeah. is, I didn't have a boyfriend, right? Yeah. And it's a bit like talking about being gay if you don't have a boyfriend. It's all theoretical at that stage. Yeah. Like I hadn't actually done anything. Yeah. I, it was just a theoretical thing and that I'd quite like to get with a guy. It's not even like I'd even managed to do it. Yeah. That's, it was only when I had a boyfriend, I thought, okay, this is something... You know, and I come with this quote is, but someone said that the idea of, of, of it, you know, it's a bit like kind of calling myself a footballer and all I've ever done is watch a few matches. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. You have to really be doing it. You'd get on the pitch and play. <laughs> and I was like, no, oh, I, I didn't want to, yeah. But I, I, it. I know what you're saying, because my, my son, um, he's six years old now. Yeah. And I can tell you now, I'm never going to have a sex conversation with them because they don't <laughs> need it. I mean, the flipping. It's like back in my day, right? Yeah. We would like we would get like a girly magazine and it'd be Razzle or Penthouse or something yep. like look that. At the bits. Ooh, look at that. So when you're like a small kid. Yeah. But this day and age they're flipping they know more than I do. I know it's true. Just like on the internet. Well you have to watch you have to watch them because then they start to look they start to think that what they see on the internet is normal. Yeah. And you see some of the stuff that's on the internet, you're like, this is not normal, you know. And I think that maybe Maybe it's important for kids to know that what they're seeing on the internet, they are learning stuff on the internet. Yeah. For them to know that that's not normal. And you know what? When you get a girlfriend, there's a lot of stuff on there that she's not going to be expecting you to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, it's the same for gays, you know, it's the same for gay people as well. You see stuff on the internet and you think, mm. That's not what really happens in most people's bedrooms when they have loving, normal relationships yeah. and when they have, like, you know you know, regular, sweet, nice relationships with each other, there's, there's yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not all Fifty Shades of Grey, is it? No, that's right. No, yeah. definitely not. <laughs> um, so, what would your advice to be to people, say, some of our audience, like, um, uh, like thinking, God, you know, I am gay, but I want to sort of come out and stuff like that. And it's, it's quite, it's, we're in a day and age where it's like, it's quite, it, it's cool, yeah. it's more cool than it was. What would yes. you, if they're scared to death, Yes. What would your advice to be to people? I think you have to do it, whatever. Just be like, I don't, I here think, it is. I think if at some point. On Facebook. Have, <laughs> it's, it's some point, yeah, I am. However, way you do it, and you've got, you, it's going to be different for everyone. Because I think a lot of people think that they're going to be rejected, and actually they get quite surprised at how their parents kind of knew. 
or their family and their friends kind of knew anyway. Yeah. That's really, most of the time, that's what I hear from people. They yeah. go, I was terrified of coming out, and I told my mum, or I told my dad, or I told my auntie, or my uncle, or my granny, whoever it was, all my friends, and they all turn around and go, yeah, we thought so. Yeah. <laughs> that's 90% of what happens. Um, I think that there are cases where it can be quite tough, and there's cases when people do face rejection, or even worse, violence, yeah. or being booted out of their homes. And I think in that case, you need to, people need to be prepared to find help and support from other places. Yeah. And there's organizations like the Albert Kennedy Trust, who are fantastic, where they help people that are at risk of becoming homeless when they come out. And they're an amazing, amazing organization who work mostly in London and in Manchester. Um, uh, one of the charities I support and Stonewall organizations like that and can give people support and yeah. advice and all that stuff so I think get as much support get as much advice as you possibly can but I think at the end of the day if you can get around to doing it and living life as a kind of authentic person yeah. who is doing what they want and living it the way they want to live it my goodness you'll never go back and you'll never look back and I don't think I know anyone who's ever regretted it yeah and, you know, um, so I was looking into Stonewall tonight just before we sort of met up. Your mum mm. has been doing amazing things. She'd been nominated yes. uh, for awards and things like that. Mm. And then I was looking at Stonewall and it was like Ian McKellen had set it up. Yes. And this is, you're going to be like, God, sort it out, Mark. Ian's one of the, well, Ian's I didn't, one of the he's this, one of the founders. This yeah. is the crazy shit. Yeah. I didn't even know he was gay. <laughs> How, really? No, I didn't know. I was like, Ian McKellen is like, I was like, Gandalf is gay. Yeah. And I like I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, I'm way behind with all of there that sort go. of stuff. There you go. No, no, he's very good. And he's very good. He does a lot of visits around schools and stuff to talk to young people and try to kind of help people through bullying and yeah. trying trying to eradicate bullying in schools. And um, so if there are young people who think they might be gay, they've got like a role model. And he's yeah. a great role model because he just yeah, walks in and, and everyone knows exactly who he is. You Gandalf. Know? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah. great, Gandalf's gay. It's okay. Um, <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's wonderful. He does that. That's and, brilliant. And I know people that are policemen who do that or, or yeah. police women who do that and, um, you know, fire people and all kinds of different people who go in yeah. as role models and do this stuff and Stonewall organises it. So it's really, really great work they do. And, um, yeah, there's probably lots of... Uh, you know, I think he came, must have come out such a long time ago now that I think it probably Shit. passed you by. I really, yeah, I really should well, know about this. once someone's out, it's not a news story yeah. anymore. I knew Boy George was gay. Well, yeah, yeah. Slightly more obvious, that one. And Julian Cleary. <laughs> I was pretty <laughs> sussed on them too. Pretty My sussed on those guys. Went straight off there. I was like, definitely. Yeah. Uh, go back to sort of success and stuff like that. How important is it, would you say, to associate with the right people? Um, it's really important. But that's probably just as important, no matter who you are. Yeah. You know, whether you're successful or not, and whether whether you're, that's a that's a rule for life, isn't it? Make sure you're around good people. Yeah. You know, people that you enjoy being around, and people that um, people that can be there for you when you need them, and all that stuff. I think it's the same if you're successful and not. It's probably more likely to be um, uh, surrounded by uh, people that. Um, might do you harm when you're successful because you attract a certain you, yeah you can attract people that, that, that just just they just want to sort of suck yeah it's want a piece of you that's the wrong thing to say to, they want to suck you dry i want to say oh, that's wrong yes. for me to say that well that's a bit you know it, yeah you know what i you know what i mean I they want to mean. suck all the power um, out of you sort of thing well yeah th there's people that are attracted to success but that's also that's not or fame or success yeah. um and they kind of want a bit of piece of that and they, they're attracted to it and that's not the right reason to hang around with anyone. Yeah. Um, but um, I think it's this, there aren't any real, there aren't any rules to it that I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't say are just to do with being successful. I mean, there are, the, the same rules apply really in life if it would be successful or not, I think. Yeah. And um, we, we talked about facing fears and stuff like that. Uh -huh. When, um, before you become successful with the with the, the, the with, with the feeling and stuff like uh -huh. that, did you go around telling people I'm going to be uh, a, a star with this pop group or no, how you just you just sort of quietly went under the radar and then bang? Um, well, I mean, you have a kind of an internal kind of um, confidence, yeah, which is I think important to have. 
um, you have a certain idea that you could do something interesting or something good and something that's valuable or something which is, is um, you know, uh, worth putting out there. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Yeah. You know, sometimes you're like, okay, I'm going to put this out there. Because if if you if you're uh, if you don't believe that, then you would never get as far as even putting yourself forward, would you? Yeah. You know. So you have a bit of an internal. You don't go and tell anyone else. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> what if it doesn't work? You know. That's, well, a, that's a bit mad. If you spend, you, yeah, spend the whole time yeah, going, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be amazing, I'm going to be a, you know, and then we it doesn't that. work. We see that on x <laughs> I love how Dan is just like on all of the, he's on all of the memorabilia. Like, you I know, know this is old like, Keith won't mind. Yeah, Keith Richards, he won't, he won't mind at he all. He won't mind, will he? Yeah. Um, so you just did Glastonbury. Yes. How was that? Lovely. It's great. And they, who were you there We with? did Glastonbury about 10 years before, actually. Yeah. We did it. It's about 10 years since we played Glastonbury. So it was lovely. I used to go to Glastonbury when I was a kid. My dad used to take me to Glastonbury when, I was, when I was little. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, it was lovely. And this year I went to my camper. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love it. It's great. I mean, it's, it's a bit full on. I mean, it's, you know, for hundreds of thousands of people wading around in mud, it gets a bit exhausting. But... Um, but it's a it's a great festival. I mean, it's the greatest it's, festival in the world. It is massive. How do you feel when you just go out on stage? Do you do you still get nervous? You're so yes, no, I do get nervous. Yeah, yeah. There's always some nerves. I, I think it, the, there's a kind of weird. Um, it's paradoxically, I think if I didn't feel nerves, then I would genuinely just be terrified. Yeah. It's like I'm so used to the nerves now that if I kind of like was walking out on stage and didn't have the nerves, I would suddenly think, oh my god, something really wrong here. Yeah. And just get used to them and you just deal with it. And you just kind of distract yourself and the nerves are probably part of the the preparation for going on a stage and doing a good show, I think. How far into the sort of song would you say that or or the you rock up, you're like, here I am, use the microphone, there's tens of thousands of people out there, like, and um, do you ever, um, how long is it into it before you lose the nerves, before you like, you start playing and you're like, boom, now I'm oh, confident. Actually, as soon as I start singing, really, it's really quick. Straight away. Yeah. As soon as I walk out on the stage and I see the crowd and I kind of, I, within a split second, I've worked out what kind of crowd it is. In my head, I'm already going, what songs on a set list I want to keep and what ones I don't. Yeah. And um, there's a million things to think about, like is your microphone the right height? Is the guitar quite the right tone? You might need to go and twist your amp a little bit, pedals in the right place. Um, a million little really, really quick things that you have to think yeah. about. And once they're all in order, and that really happens in a split second, and I start singing, and I kind of know it's going to be fine. Or I know that I've got to fix this and fix that, or I might signal to the microphone and my vocal isn't loud enough in the wedge, or it's too loud or something. I signal to the engineer to bring it down. All these little quick things have to happen. Yeah. Once that's all set, then I just try and enjoy the gig. Yeah. You know, after that. The nerves really kind of go pretty instantaneously. As soon as you walk out on the stage, I feel at home on the stage. And, yeah. I, and, and then I just get on with it. And I try to enjoy it. I because I, I do a bit of public speaking and like yeah. I, when I go up on the stage sometimes it's like uh, I'm like initially same thing mm -hmm. nervous and I'm like sort of <gasps> yeah, what, what if you just properly. stand there and you're like and you're like tumbleweeds blowing across the stage and sort yeah. of you know, you can hear the birds whistling in the background, and thankfully it's never been that. I thought, just, just start talking. Yeah. <laughs> and I sort of fumble my way you fumble into your way it. In. You do. Well, yeah, and also, I mean, the worst thing is that you get the dry mouth and yeah. all that stuff. But the, the one thing I struggle with sometimes um, is live radio, because sometimes you'll be doing a chat show and a, or a talk show on a live radio thing. Yeah. And actually, live TVs can be a bit like that. When they've got an audience, it's fine, because I've got an audience to work to. But if all you've got is kind of you and a microphone and you know there's a couple of millions millions of people yeah um you know if, you, if i'm doing uh you know graham norton show or one of those shows yeah. and i know for a fact that there's a load of people listening <laughs> and i've been doing it for 10 years you think i'll get used to it and i think i've got to sing really well and often it's quite early in the morning if you're doing chris evans on one of those shows yeah. it's, like it's early in the morning um, you warm up your voice as much as you can. And then when it comes to it, I get like a mad dry throat. Yeah. And I just I need to drink water and I can't get the water in because he's just asking you a question and he's chatting and it's all high energy. And then he goes, are you going to sing a song? Yeah, I'm going to sing a song. Bang. That's the hardest kind of gig. Yeah. For me, that's way harder than walking out there in front of hundreds of thousands of people. You're doing a bit of theatre, Dan. Tell us I about am. that. 
Well, yes, I I wanted to write a, a musical, um, and I've been thinking about it for years. People always said that feeling songs had a certain like theatricality to them, yeah. um, and I suppose because they're melodic and they're fruity, I suppose. Yeah, they're easy um, to listen to, aren't they? Yeah, and they're but they're also they've got like harmonies and middle eights and B sections and little little outros and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, stuff that that feels a bit theatrical. Um, so someone put that kind of planted that idea in my brain years and years and years ago. And I've always been a fan of musical theatre. Not all of it, but some bits of music. More rock and roll musical theatre yeah. I've always liked, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then I got approached um, a couple of years ago by um, director and um, people at the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. Yeah. Who I'd met via Michael Ball. And they basically said we have this idea for a show and will you write it yeah I was like, absolutely i will yeah so yeah. i'm doing the music and a guy called tom mccray yeah. is is writing the book for it and we were approached together and they said we think you guys should 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 do this show so we've done it and we, we're tickets on sale and we're opening on in february so it's actually happened but you know it's happening but um what what is the, i never what is thought, the name of the show where can people see this stuff the show is called everybody's talking about jamie yeah and it's at the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. Yeah. And um, it opens in February. So in February 2017. So, so you're fantastic. Yeah, and the tickets are on sale now and it's selling really well. So I'm really excited because it's a very limited run. Yeah. So um, it's going to be really a kind of a happening, a, a, a bit of an event, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's about, it's a completely original um, score, an original uh, script. Um, and it's inspired by a documentary about a 16 year old boy who wanted to go to his high school prom in a dress and <laughs> it's a true story there's a boy from the north of england yeah yeah and he just did he just went there and did it and and the school said he couldn't they said that we, yeah. well, there wasn't allowed and it was there would be complaints and stuff and and kind of the kids he managed to win the kids around and Eventually, the kids all decide to back him up and say, well, we're not going in unless Jamie can go in. And, and so they have to let him in. And it's a lovely little story. And it's only a little half-hour documentary. We've yeah. expanded it into this two-hour show that, that has all kinds of crazy subplots and storylines and lots of other characters. And it has um, a, real, a real story to tell about, about what it is to be 16 and what it is to be struggling with identity yeah and i don't think that's just because he wants to wear a dress i think it's actually because he's 16 i think that everyone struggles with identity to a certain extent yeah when i've worn a few dresses myself mate yeah <laughs> in the oh, army you know and the amount of people in the forces yeah, that are wearing dresses and stuff i reckon, I reckon there's a lot of really really tough guys a you're so funny a frock. yeah yeah well it's, there's a tradition of it you know it's a traditional thing um you know, my granddad used to love putting a dress on to dress up for fancy dress evenings or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, no, I think, I think it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a just a lovely family show. Yeah. It's really fun. It's modern and it's about young people. Wait, and I think the young people will enjoy it. I think young people will go to the theatre and think, wow, this is theatre for me. Because yeah. the songs are poppy and they're, they're, they're catchy and you can sing along to them. But yeah. they're relevant to a story which is also speaking to young people. And it's about new people in a new world. And, and, and it's, you know, kind of, you know, he's a gay kid in the story. But the fact that he's gay isn't the story. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Which is quite unusual. It's quite modern. There are a lot of gay kids now who come out and it's not a big deal. No. And they just live their life as gay kids and it's kind of all right. And that's not our story. Our story is that. It's... it's, it's it's not a big deal in the story that he's gay. There is a bit, uh, there is a big deal in the story is that he wants to wear a dress to the prom. Yeah. And he genuinely wants to express himself that way. And that's where he comes into trouble because people start thinking about, people get their head in a funny place about gender. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting. It's just an interesting place to write drama, you know. Um, so uh, it's a really interesting story. And, and I've got an amazing director called Jonathan Butterall who really is extraordinary. And he's, been working in New York for 10 years and he's just come over to Sheffield to do it. Yeah. Um, recently he's come over to the UK to work with us. And um, yeah, it's been a real experience and I can't wait to do the next one. I've already got the next one planned in my head and the one after that and the one That's after fantastic. that. That's fantastic. You know, yeah. I just, I love writing for theatre 
and it gives me a break from writing for the feeling. Yeah. I still write for the feeling, and I'll still go and do another feeling album. But in the in the in the meantime, um, I've got all these mad ideas musically that work really well in theatre. Do you ever ever? Because I'm I'm I've got a book coming out, right? Uh, so um, when you started writing, did you find it difficult to write at the start, or did you just like did it just flow, and then you just did it every day? How often do you write? Well, I've always found lyrics difficult. Um, yeah, they're hard. You know, they are. Um, Writing music for me is, comes very naturally and very easily. It's just like tunes and, and just there. bashing away at the piano. That's yeah. that's not a problem for me. But part of writing is is that initial spark of inspiration. But the really hard part of writing is finishing it. Yeah. You know, and knuckling down and making it have structure, and making it have, and making it so that it's not too bloated and too many words and saying too much and it's about honing it down so that it's kind of perfect and tight and every sentence is, is there for a reason every word is there for a reason and in pop music it's like every note is there for a reason yeah you know it, it's it's um, the craft of it is the bit that needs developing and working on and working on yeah. the inspiration bit comes for free you know that initial kind of come up with a tune that comes for free it's then moulding it into something which is in my world a perfect pop song yeah. or for a novelist a perfect novel or for a playwright the perfect script you know I think it really um, it's the craft that gets you into that place and I love it because when I work in theatre I get to flex those muscles a bit you know the, the craft muscles a bit I get, yeah. to, I get to use use those a lot because I've got a lot of problems to solve um, musically so and, and with your theatre thing is there a sort of age is it like do you have to be like over twelve to go to that? Thing no, or? no, it's 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 all ages. And, Everyone. Um, yeah, yeah. There's well, a little bit of swearing in it, but yeah. it's all right. Not not bad. It's all right. It's not bad. It's not it's not a rude show. There's no c words in it. Nothing like that. No c words <laughs> in it. They're just just the tiny. Can you imagine words. that this lovely sort of thing, and then it's like yeah. Well, <sighs> no, there's no nasty words in it. In it, but or a couple of like swear words, yeah. but only to make it feel real, and. Um, no, I think I think it's like uh, a show that people from all different ages would enjoy. I think the old traditional theatre fans will like it because it is, it's it's a well, in my opinion, a well constructed piece of drama. Yeah, and it's about it's also about his mum and how she deals with the whole situation as much as it yeah. is about him. But also, if you're a teenager, you'll love it because the sixteen year old kids in the show who are who are telling their story about what it's like to be in a rubbish school. Yeah. You know, they're in a crap school. They've got a teacher who, who doesn't really respect them, but is just kind of controlling them and doing whatever the teacher needs to do to get by. And there's kids that are the cool kids and the kids that don't fit in and the ones that are quirky and different for whatever reason, they're yeah. quirky and different. And it has how they all deal with each other and how they... And then there's some drag queens thrown in. Who like you've got to get the drag queens. Out of there. There's drag queens <laughs> in there. Trust me, the drag queens. Everyone there. loves drag queens, though, don't they? They love drag queens. Everyone yeah. loves drag queens. And also, gender stuff is kind of on point a bit, a bit, really, because because I think that's a new frontier of us, us discovering yeah. discovering where we're going to go next. Because I think that with with sexuality having been dealt with a bit, because yeah. we have equal marriage, not that it's not that it's still not a problem for some people. But generally, I think it's we've come a long way with that. Massively, but yeah. But when we come to gender issues, we've still got a long way to go. We still yeah. don't really... We still treat women and men in a very weirdly separate way. Yeah. And if, if you're a, a boy who wants to express himself by dressing up and, and looking more feminine, then... Um, or the other way around, if it's a woman who wants to look more masculine for whatever reason, um, you run up a lot... It puts a lot of, rubs a lot of people up the wrong way. And you think, why is that? You know, you think, why is it that, What's it, that what, the what people is it in get them? so upset yeah. about it? You know, well, I think it's, I don't care who wants to do whatever they want to do for whatever reason, as long as it's not hurting anyone. Yeah. But for some reason, people in society get really stressed out about yeah. people. When they, <gasps> right? You know, when they're like, yeah. oh, you're challenging the normal. Yeah. You know? And actually, we live in a culture which is so cool because... There's been people out there before us, like Freddie Mercury, you know, yeah. and these rock and roll stars and these and androgynous rock stars like Bowie and people who who, who didn't just do things the normal, the boring. George way. Michael and Elton John. Yeah. And there's so many, All isn't of there? Them. Like? And I think you know those those 
stars that were androgynous and were especially Bowie really yeah who kind of like walked up there with loads of makeup on and he wasn't gay he was just being amazing and fabulous yeah and an artistic and challenging what the stereotypical man thing is yeah and in the same way that Annie Lennox when she did the Sweet Dreams video yeah and she's got that cropped red yeah. hair and she's so masculine and gorgeous yeah and she was challenging what a woman's supposed to look like you know and I kind of think this day and age where are those people where are those people challenging the gender norms it seems to me like in pop music and in movies and stuff, all the women are kind of skinny girls with their boobs out and their legs yeah. all showing and all this, it's all this, you know, and all the guys are super tonk and masculine. And yeah. I'm like, I don't, okay, I don't mind that, but I also want to see some of the other. I want to see yeah, some everything. androgyny. And rock and roll used to be so androgynous and, and edgy and different, but it feels a bit like, it feels a bit boring now. And I worry yeah. that, I worry that, that we've kind of like split that binary a bit too much now. It is a lot of the the artists have really changed things, haven't they? Because it's, it's like almost on one side you've got like the politicians, yeah. and the, this is right and this is politically correct. And you yeah. love your tie here, and then you've got these artists that are like these free spirits. Yes, and it's like it kind of touches all on on that sort of stuff on the Matrix and stuff. And you've yeah, got yeah. these are the rules and yeah, these yeah. are the controls, and then you've got these guys who just dress how they want to dress, yeah, and yeah. The, this is who I am, and. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's every, yeah, what do you think about that? Well, I think rock and roll uh, art has always challenged society and stuff. I just yeah. don't think it does it as much now as it should do. Do you think you'll ever, do you think it's ever going to get to a stage where it's like quite acceptable at the moment where people can just sort of boyfriend, girlfriend walk down the street holding hands? Yeah. Do you think there'll ever be a stage in history where there'll be two guys walking down um, Oxford Street or wherever? Yeah. And do you think? where people are just going to go like... Because people are almost at the stage now where they're like, are you gay? I think so what? Almost. I think, uh, yeah, I think, first of all, the answer is yes. I think it'll happen. Yeah. Um, and I think there are places where it's almost... Yeah, acceptable. There. I yeah. think lots of places like London, there's little bubbles in the world where I think it's almost acceptable. And that'll spread, and there'll be more and more places in the world where it becomes um, accepted, you know? Yeah. Um, but we're getting there, but slowly but surely. Yeah. We have to be patient. Yeah, yeah. Um, people that want to be successful, have you got, like, before we wrap up, sort of three tips on succeeding, at what you want to succeed at? I'd be lucky, I think. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know. Save I hate the lottery. Your... Well, because I think people like me get asked that question a lot. Yeah. And I don't know how much of my success is just luck. It's going to be I mean, an element of luck. I know that I work hard. Yeah. And I know that I had a vision and I went for it. And I know that I've stuck to my guns. And I know I've done all those cliche things that people tell. But also, I must have been lucky. Yeah. You know? Um, and I'm sure there's lots of people that have stuck to their guns and had a vision and, and gone with it and done all that stuff, be themselves. And, and you know what I mean? And, and I'm sure people have all done various sort of things and haven't been successful and they just yeah. haven't had the luck. So, but there is maybe something to be said for making your own luck. I don't know. Yeah. You know, sort of a bit of both, would you say? Well, if, if you're a singer, sing as much as you can. Get out there, be in front of people, sing, turn up at open mic sessions, to go and do gigs. I mean, I did 10 shows a week in the Alps. With the, with the with the boys and there were two hour shows and we're carrying our stuff and it was hard work yeah. carrying our crap through the snow and set up our own PA systems and all that stuff yeah. for ten, ten, 10 of them a week or where you're out and um, so that was great training great training ground and I think that if I'd had any advice it was like whatever you're doing just do it and do more and more and more of it until you get so bloody good at it that, that someone's gonna they're gonna say they're gonna be like off. this guy is good or this yeah. team of people I they are shit you do online. something enough and, you, and you're doing it for the right reasons because you love it yeah you will be doing it a lot anyway and uh, just do it and 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 do it um, and get as good as you can yeah and um, you also you, you mentioned about the play and stuff like that coming out yes what uh, what, and that's opening the Crucible February yes. uh, 2017. That's right, yes. That'd be amazing. And the yeah. Crucible, I mean, everyone knows in the UK. Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful well, theatre. The and everyone knows it because the World Snooker. Snooker Championship, that's right. isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, and where else can, what else is coming up for you? Um, the Feeling Touring again in um, October. Yeah. And that's our 
I call it a farewell tour. Yeah. Because it's not, a, you know, it's not a goodbye forever tour. It's just yeah. a farewell for now tour. <laughs> where are yeah, but but where are you going to be? All over the UK. Just all over. Yeah, you're we're Wales. adding dates all the time. You're coming to Wales, mate. I don't. You're not coming to Wales. Well, maybe, maybe. I do you know. What? I haven't looked at the dates. It's really hit me there. I bet you get you get as far as Bristol, and then you realise that's what normally happens. There yeah. we go. Yeah, but no, um, hopefully, hopefully there's a show in Cardiff. I don't know. I, I think there might be. So yeah, there probably there's a lot of people is. do stuff in Cardiff, don't yeah, they? Yeah. And how, how else can people see see the stuff you do? You're, are you on Twitter? You're on Facebook? We're on all of the things. Yes. Yeah. I know yeah. all of this anyway. All of the I things. just ask for these guys. Um, so we have the thefeeling.com is probably the first place yeah. to go to. Um, and yeah, the Facebook is the feeling, and you know, it's it's. I, th I think it's the feeling or the feeling band, maybe. Yeah. For for things like Twitter and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, feeling Insta. Fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, and we, we try and post on that stuff. We're like we're like old fashioned. We we we're terrible with social media. We need to get better at it. Yeah. But the website is the website's always it's updated there. and stuff. And um, people want to know about us for how to get tickets for the tours and stuff. That's all happening. Yeah. Brilliant. On there. Dan Gillespie sells. It has been an honour and much. a pleasure. It's been Thank lovely. you. Thank yeah, you thanks me. very much, mate. Thank you very much for watching, guys. We've got a lot of amazing interviews coming up soon. And have an amazing week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.